right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's nice to see you again. So it's my second time here. And today I brought you uh, my first iOS app project called SFC Bus Timer. So uh, before I get further into it, let me just throw in the quick self-introduction I did last month. So my name is Leonard, and I'm a third year at KO University. And I was born in Korea. I lived in the US for about seven years. I went to NYU, and then I came back to Korea for my military service for a couple of years. And then I just didn't graduate at NYU, but I switched my uh, university to KO University. And now I'm a third year. So it's been about two and a half years since I came to Japan. OK. So now getting into my project. Okay, so what is SFC bus timer? Okay, so how many of you guys here know SFC? Wait, nobody? There, there, there must be people working at Medica who are from SFC. Okay, so SFC is a K University Shona Fujisawa campus. Um, so this is my campus, and actually, like a lot of my friends are working at Medica, so I thought you knew, but maybe they're not engineers, perhaps. Okay, let's see. Shonan Fujisawa campus. Yeah. What's funny is um, because we're KU University, and the acronym is like KU Shonan Fujisawa campus, right? But when they first came out with the acronym idea, it almost became KFC. <laughs> Until someone stepped in and said, yeah, we should probably not do that. Okay, so that aside. Um, the SFC bus timer is basically a bus timer app for students in our campus. So, um, you might ask, okay, why do you need a bus timer in 2019 when you have Google Maps and Maps and all the applications? Well, it turns out that uh, on our campus, we have two bus stops. So, you see the first blue arrow. Um, that is one bus stop that is inside the campus. And there's also another bus stop that is outside the campus called Rotary. And then... There are two main stations um, the buses are taking students to. So one is Shonanda Station, which is where I live, and another one is Tsujizo Station. And they're both near uh, Fujisa City and Shonanda area. So the reason why I made this bus timer is that the departure time for these two stations are different depending on the time of the day. And also, even though if it's a national holiday, sometimes we have classes. And during those class times, the university actually asks the local bus company to adjust their schedule just for us. So there are many like things that are not quite updated in Google Maps and other apps that um, we had to um, provide service to our students. So uh, in my last presentation, I brought my first app, which was a very prototype-ish. And well, this is actually not the uh, my prototype. This was a bus timer that somebody else made years ago. But the problem was that this button right there, which changes the station, had a code that goes like this. So even if you press it, I mean, it's a joke. So even if you press it, sometimes the button didn't work. And I'm assuming this is how they coded it, um, <laughs> which I hope they didn't. But okay, oh, I totally messed up the layout. Okay, I can show you that later. But it had a terrible UI, I mean, it has zero UI, and this is how I presented it last time. Um, so if you can see right here, there's virtually no UI, just pure text, and it just shows only one bus information, and it is usable, but it's not that useful. So updates from uh, January presentation. Uh, me and uh, my, my teammates and I worked on updating the UI, refactored the code, and we also finally managed to publish this to the app, um, app Store um, on March. So since then, it's funny because we haven't talked about this app to any of our students, but somehow like people found out about it and they started downloading like 230 apps. And yeah, I guess it was my first app <laughs> I ever published, so I was pretty excited about it. Okay, so now to the demo. Build it here. Okay. 
I'm hoping this doesn't break, because last time I had a sec fault. <laughs> because I didn't implement certain code. But, okay. Okay, so here it is right now. This is uh, how it looks like when you download from the App Store. Um, so it goes from SFC, to so digital station, and you can scroll down to see the next buses coming up. And also you can just uh, switch. And this works 100% of the time, unlike the uh, previous version somebody made. And you can change the station from the settings menu, and you can just up update sometimes when it bugs. And yeah, there are types of buses, and actually where it lives, because we had two different departures uh, at SFC. And yeah, this is pretty much the app. And yeah, that is uh, how the app looks like. Okay, now just to briefly go through the code. Last time I had everything just smashed into the view controller because it was my first time making. Uh, no one told me this is how you should do it or you're not supposed to do it. So I presented my same thing in my uh, school seminar and then somebody just raised their hand and be like, okay, you, you don't do that. And so after that, I started uh, separating the files into some data utils, data utils. So the data utils is basically the uh, file that grabs the scheduled data that's in the web AP, my, my JSON API. And then data utils, this is where it handles whether today is holiday or not. <clears throat> um, also the, yeah, the UI for the buttons in the table cell. And then after that, it's just a view, control, view controller that runs the main. Um, and in the, my first presentation, I talked about how I didn't really know about the, the multi-threaded asynchronous um, shorty. So um, I had to spend like entire day debugging it because I didn't know I was using multi-threaded. But okay, so this is how I got my stuff working. And I'm using two packages here. So Swift JSON is uh, made my life so much easier uh, working with the JSON file in Swift. And another package uh, library was the, um, oh, this one, the Eureka. So this is just a library that helped me set up the settings page I showed earlier. Uh, it made setting things up really easy. Okay, so now I'll go back to the presentation. So, um, I still have many problems for this app. The first thing is that I did not think through about the architecture when I was beginning it. So right now I have to manually uh, update the schedule if the bus company decides to up, uh, change their bus schedule. So that thing needs to be fixed probably through the automated server. Um, and also second part is that the teammate who wrote a Ruby code for data scraping um, I don't know why, but his code is broken. <laughs> so I just rewrote everything in uh, Python. And I'll be re-implementing that, because um, I couldn't read his code. And let's see. Oh yeah, the special sketch for KO, I talked about how I need to um, adjust the dates for the class days, even though they're holidays. And also I need more failure safe points. So if there's if it fails to fetch the data somehow, or if it fails to load the data, I shouldn't crash the app entirely, but it's been happening on like a couple devices so far, so I should probably work on that as well. Also, there were some UI failures, um, so all the phones are fine, but iPhone SE had a problem because it couldn't really see the schedule at the bottom, and also the, the settings button was like squished like this. I don't know why, but I'll try to figure that out. Okay, I have that repeated somehow. Okay, um, so, in terms of figuring out the server, this is my first time actually trying to experience, okay, what should I do to set up the server? And I was talking to my friend over the Skype, and because I didn't really understand what it meant to connect through, send the request through public IP, and um, so I was using this, uh, if you see post office analogy and the mailman analogy to see. But the point is, I'm basically sending the request to the AWS or something, and then there will be two uh, programs running. So one will be Node.js just getting my request and sending the data back 
to my iPhone app, and then there will be another script in Python this time running regularly in Chrome tab, just scraping and making sure that the data is updated. The only thing is that I was kind of overthinking when I was thinking about this, because if you see my code, I'm basically fetching this data from this URL here. And on the bottom left is the, how the data looks like. It's literally just a JSON API. And actually, that website that hosts my JSON API for free has this API where I can just update the JSON. So I don't even have to do all that. I can just update this through my server or even just whenever I open my laptop. And I think that will solve the problem. So from now on, um, I'll definitely do be doing the schedule automation. Also improve the accessibility features because I have a friend who is blind and he would like to use this app and he's been using this app. The problem is that this doesn't read as time but this just rather is in like 00, zero colon 004027. Zero, 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 two, two, so I need to improve on that aspect, but I don't quite know how to do it, so I'll figure that out. And warning features, um, alarms, people wanted to know um, when the next bus is. Also the stations in between, there are other stations in between Shonandai and SFC, which I have to accommodate for. Um, also, I wanted to show the entire bus schedule because right now I, can't see that, I cannot see the previous buses that has already passed. Also in the future, I hope I can add this to Apple Watch and because there are a lot of people who are still using Android and they also wanted, wanted the web version somehow, I'm thinking if I should um, work on the React Native because I, I've done Android before, but right now in my group, there are many people who want to do web at the same time. And because this was like a team project, I kind of had to um, compromise there, so we're thinking about just doing things in JavaScript and hopefully I can just use React Native and generate native somehow. Okay, um, so what I learned is that I need to think through my data structure first um, so that there's no need to rewrite the, there's no need to rewrite, um, no need to rewrite the Python or Ruby script. Okay, so do not overthink. So I talked about it earlier, how I can just update my JSON API using their API. And third is not trust your friends, because um, when, I, when I introduced this to my friends, they just ran, went on and just like, yeah, gave me like three star reviews and actually just became one today. So I'm, I'm hoping I can just, yeah, <laughs> I hope they can fix that. But okay, thank you, and this is my presentation. Do you have any questions? Questions? When you were doing the scraping in Python, uh, what libraries were you using? Uh, beautiful soup. Okay. Actually, that reminds me there is a Swift soup, which, which means I can probably, I might be able to actually do it directly. But yeah, I'm using beautiful soup right now. Sounds tasty. Do we have other questions? So the, <clears throat> the data that's getting scraped off the web page, is that like real time updated or is it just a fixed timetable? Uh, it is not real time updated yet, but they only change it about like once in six months. So right now it's just text and I cannot really change it, but I will be updating it so that it can be real time. Oh, also for the beautiful soup, um, I think I'll just keep doing a beautiful soup because now that we're going to make Android and other versions, I think it would be better to just have one um, app that they can just send it to multiple platforms. Any comments? I'm, I'm curious about your team structure. It seems like you mentioned there were several other people that you worked with on this. Can you talk about what the structure of the team was and kind of who held what kind of responsibility? So um, there were four people. So in the beginning, it was um, Ono. He was in charge of the UI. Ryota was in charge of data scraping and data structures. And it was me and Yutoku, 
that were in charge of um, the main logic and the coding back in front end part. But as time went on, um, unfortunately the Ruby script failed and um, Onokun was kind of getting quite busy. So it was mainly uh, me and Yutokun working on the, just basically full stack a bit. Yeah. How did you decide to use Python for the scraping instead of Ruby? Oh, um, it's just that that was the language I was most comfortable with. I have the most experience in. So I was able to set it up just really quickly. Yeah. Could you share some of that Python code with us today? Uh, yeah. And maybe some of the challenges you faced in writing it? Yeah, uh, please give me a moment. Sure. And am I the only one who wants to see some Python code? Or Yeah? OK. And is this a service? Sorry to distract you while you're doing this. But is this a service that is constantly running this Python code? Uh, that, that will be my next step. Okay. So that will be what I'm in, going to be implementing using front end, and probably AWS. So this just triggers once you have your JSON or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right now it's just uh, really clunky code. Um, Sorry, I actually forgot where the file is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I actually forgot where the file is. Okay. Yeah, I I'll share it next time I update my app. How 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 are you calling? Like, how is that Python code being called? How are you scraping the? Oh, right right now I'm just running it manually. Okay. So I'll be manually running the script, get the data, upload it to this website called myjson.com, which just hosts the JSON data for free, uh, and then um, and that's then, where this URL is accessing here. Okay. You access that URL from the from the iOS app. So um, you could do, uh, push the script. I mean, upload the script to the uh, service called Heroku, and you can specific you can like specify to please run the script like every one or two hour, and you do that, you don't have to like run it manually, and you can use like even JavaScript, Python, and Ruby for sure. Maybe even script. Okay. Run the script. Yeah. Right. Um. Right, so to update this URL, I can just use Heroku. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good way to do it. Also, host the, I mean, generate the JSON mm -hmm. on this website with the script and just um, getting the JSON from this uh, website. I mean, Heroku is like serving. Like serving okay. So I can have JSON inside my Heroku free dino yeah. or something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. and it's free. Yeah, it's, um, what, is, what is the add on called, like scheduler or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you can just say right. to run your, well, in Ruby case, you run a rate test, like every 10 mm -hmm. minutes or every hour. So it's very easy to do. For a fast schedule, I would assume once a day at night is probably fine. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you're not changing the bus schedule like every day. Yeah. yeah. And if you, just as long as you have it by like the morning of the day that it changes, you'll be fine. Yeah. But you can actually do that. I think it is one Linux smart. If you just have your own. Uh, I don't know where you host your code, but you just can go to the administration panel. I don't remember the name of the service, but it's like you just need to specify 
as a scheduler. Yeah, like when do you want to rerun the script? And it's quite common for all scrappers and mm -hmm. stuff. So, yeah. Hey, and did you say how many users you have in the day to day? Um, right now, 230 units were shipped. I actually don't know how to read the statistics for that, but it said 230 units uh, shipped. So. Well, I'm assuming something that can scale, like you're not going to expect millions of users. Uh, this probably not. This is just limited to only people in my campus, on my campus. But hopefully I can make something scalable out of this. Uh, so if you have any ideas or suggestions, then I'm welcome. So have you considered adding analytics to it so that you can actually know what's happening, like how your app is being used, and how many installs you're having, or how many daily launches? No, never. <laughs> See how many times people are like opening your app or checking or Can I do that through like the Apple iTunes I connect or something or um, there's lots of free analytics oh. tools. I've I've historically used a service called Mixpanel in the past. I don't know if other people have used that or have other recommendations for analytics, but a lot of analytics products provide a, an iOS SDK that allows you to track events to understand kind of how your users are utilizing the app. Can I ask, I always thought Mixpanel was pretty expensive. I haven't paid for it yet. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> love to, I would love to have that problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to have the problem that I had to give them money. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I haven't given them any money yet. If you put a Mixpanel icon on your website, they give you extra uh, events. And um, I just, with that additional ceiling, I haven't needed it. I don't remember, it's been a while since I've looked at it. But uh, they could have changed their pricing since I last, since I signed up to caveat. So, does anybody else have any other analytics? I mean, Google Analytics, uh, I think, is, is what I used it in iOS. You know, Firebase? Firebase? Fabric? Fabric's going away. Do they all provide oh. analytics for my app? Yeah. Well, Fabric is becoming Firebase. They're not going away. They're, yeah. I mean, they're <laughs> now Firebase. So how, 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 does, how does this like service work? It, like, if I publish my app, do they just take the anal analytics for me, or do I have to...? You, you generally need to download the SDK. I see. As, as another CocoaPod or, or you know, software um, library framework, and then they have an API, and you have to say, hey, register this event. When the user does an action, you register an event, and then they, they track that for you. Um, but then you also get into some GDPR kind of stuff, uh, where you need to make sure you're you know, honoring people's privacy, and people can opt out of analytical tracking, and things like that. Um, unless you're only distributing in Japan, then you don't have to worry about GDPR, which is probably a good idea um, for you to do that. Um, what, what is but GDPR? Japan does have <laughs> privacy laws, so I don't want to say you can't not worry about it completely. You just well, have to worry about Japan's privacy laws. You, you don't have to worry about GDPR, but you have to worry about Japan's privacy laws. Yeah. yeah. Whatever those may be. Which, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't pretend to be one on the internet. <laughs> no, but actually, if someone from Europe decided to download your application, so you have to care about them. So, like, this, this is because, uh, this is why many non-European companies, they still have to, have to, uh, internet. Yeah, just because internet is not doesn't have such borders, so mm -hmm. you can find your. The only reason but maybe you can, can just, the yeah, so the yeah, yeah, you, you can just uh, just disable downloading for European, but it's maybe hard for business. I don't know. It's, I'm not a lawyer. I think it's hard to say. If your app is only available in Japan, if only um, available in Japan, then yeah, I would I would consult with your local legal. Practice <laughs> practitioner. <laughs> I'd be willing to bet that people in Europe don't need the bus time around. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a hunch. <laughs> they probably don't do this in Berlin. So. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. So I, I work in a Japanese language school, so all of our students come from various countries, and things like two-factor authentication and Apple IDs are killing us. But um, yeah, you've got that. Not everybody's going to have. Uh, an Apple ID from Japan, 
sometimes we get the, I, I think we've never hit a point where somebody comes and didn't have enough or an ID, but sometimes it, it, it gets very restricting when you get like some South American countries or Egypt or something like that. Always have those international challenges to deal with. Becoming a global economy. All right, Leonard, well, I think, uh, do we have any other questions or comments? This has been really fun. Uh, so you said that you couldn't find your Python source, so do you not use any source control then? Like GitHub or? Uh, I, I am using, yes, uh, the source tree, so I have all this on the GitHub. So okay. yeah, um, it's, it's actually on my GitHub page as well. So if you go to just github.com, Leo Chu, that's where you can see this project. Yes. So, yep, yeah, that's what I have here. Cool. Excellent. Is that open Great. source? Uh, so far, I guess I made it open source because I. <laughs> well, you have all of the source code available to see. Yeah. But you have a license. If it's not licensed as open source, then it's not open source. See a license file. I do see MIT. There's a MIT license. Okay, cool. So all your source code is available in the MIT license? Ah, uh, yes. Cool. Yeah, I'll, there should be somewhere in my folder. <laughs> I'll find it. All right. Round of applause for Leonard. <laughs>